Yes, it's Monday, and it's time to talk about ghosts with me, Kevin Eustace. Just like the intro says, we have a wonderful little show for you today. We have your true paranormal ghost stories, of course. Becca's joining us towards the end of the show to discuss a little spooky thing she's found, or I've found, on Reddit, of course, in her Reddit corner. And we, of course, have a little paranormal review. I've said, of course, quite a lot already, haven't I? I must stop that, of course. And I also need to check how you're all doing, which is what the podcaster's mantra seems to be. So I hope all you guys are wonderful. Are you? Is that a collective yes? If you're on the bus listening to this, or you're driving in your car, just nod. Go on, nod. Why not? Do something the man in your ears is telling you to do. If you have, fair play you. And if you haven't, boo. Damn you. Anyway, what has been happening this week? Well, in terms of spookiness, not much really. There's been quite a good lot of articles that have been sent through by you guys. So don't forget, guys, if you do come across something in the press or you watch something and you think I'll be interested in it, chances are I will be. So send it over to contact at talkaboutghosts.com. That's also where you can send your scary stories to. And I, of course, read them out. Anyone who's new to the show, don't worry. These nonsensical voices and bits of tangents don't last throughout. I tell your stories with the grace they deserve. And a little bit of background music to add a bit of a chill factor. A few people have got in touch saying we haven't heard anything about the neighbour's cat in recent weeks. And no, you haven't. But let me rest assured the neighbour's cat is fine and well. And depending on how our house move goes, which should happen within the next couple of weeks, touch wood, he says, reaching out and touching some very cheap MDF, um, she may no longer be the neighbour's cat. He's touching his nose and winking everyone for everyone who's in on that joke. And the people who are, of course, in on the joke, a lot of them are our Patreons. Hooray! And we need to say thank you to our new wonderful Patreons, as we do each and every week. And we do that by the medium of song, which I'll be doing shortly. But when you sign up to Patreon, not only do you get two, yes, two extra shows each and every week. Yes, eight a month. What? Binge that stuff. Um, You also get your name sung out by me. Yes, you do. As a little bit of a thank you. So if you're a fan of this rather informal way of looking at the paranormal, then head over to patreon.com forward slash we need to talk about ghosts. Just like these wonderful new patrons have. The guitar is out. And we have three new wonderful patrons to say thank you to today. We have Julia Davis, Amanda and John Hulk Roberts. Good name. And this, in the style of a bit Guns N' roses goes like this. Julie Davis, Amanda, and John Hulk Roberts. You sign up to the Patreon to get those extra shows. And I want to say thank you. Here we go. And we ended it on a 7th. It was an E7 for those keeping count. Oh, don't forget, guys, if you want to become a Patreon, head over to patreon.com forward slash we need to talk about ghosts. Now, let's have a review, shall we? OK, it's review time. And today I'm going to review something which I think is genuinely one of the best paranormal documentaries ever made. It is Interview with a Poltergeist. And this can be found on YouTube. It was made by Channel 4. And Channel 4 are renowned for making relatively good, relatively obscure documentaries. Now, Interview with a Poltergeist is, of course, the documentary based on the Enfield Haunting. Or the Enfield Poltergeist, if you will. And, of course, it features all footage and interviews, actual filmed interviews with all of the main players in the Enfield story. You've got Morris Gross is there, Guy Lyon Playfair's in there. You've got all of the Hodgins, of course, including Janet, as she's possessed. Yes, there's some actual footage of the alleged possession on there. Go check it out. It's in parts. So I think there's like part one, then you have to root for part two. But it's called Interview with a Poltergeist, and you should check it out. It's sincerely two double thumbs up. It's amazing. And keep a little eye out for the interview with the two police officers because that's some timeless footage right there. Two police officers going on record to say, yes, we saw a spirit in the house. It was terrifying and we didn't know what to do. Bye. Or basically similar. You know, that's not verbatim, of course. But do go check it out. Interview with the Poltergeist. It's on YouTube. Search for it. You will find it. You will thank me later. It's two thumbs up high in the sky. 
And we are back and we're looking at your true paranormal stories and experiences. Now, we're going to start off with a little bit of an interactive thing here because something slipped through the net here, my bad. Um, and it's from our good friend Patrick Marshall, who sent us a story a while back. You may well remember it. It's from one of the now deleted shows, sadly, uh, about El Paso Playhouse. Oh, there'll be news on those deleted shows coming up at some point in the next few weeks, by the way. Um but he sent in a follow-up email back in July, and for some reason it's fell through a crack somewhere. But oh my God, it's fantastic. Now, when I say this is interactive, it's only a short email, but there's a photo that goes with it, right? So you need to go to the Facebook group. Um, just search, we need to talk about ghosts. There's a group within there. You need to ask to become a member, uh, but you'll get in regardless. But I'll put it up on there because I, I just don't know where else to put it. I'll put it also on the Instagram page. Um, so if you're on Instagram, search for We Need to Talk About Ghosts and you'll see the photo that I'm going to talk about right now. So this is the email that accompanies the photograph. El Paso High School. This is the oldest high school built here out of granite. Over 100 years old, built in 1901 before the university was built. There's tunnels underneath the school that were used by Pancho Villa himself, going from here to Mexico during the Mexican Revolution so he could go undetected. I was there for a theatre workshop. It's a big school with long hallways already with a creepy vibe when you enter. I was sitting in the audience watching the folks on stage and I just had a strange feeling that I was being watched. Looking around, I just had the urge to look up and there was a girl in a dress staring back at me only transparent with a light blue aura around her. I just stared, frozen, not able to look away till one of my classmates stood in front of me and got my attention. In brackets, this next part might be a trigger warning to some listeners. I had to research this, but it turns out the story behind her is she was waiting for her prom date and he never showed up. So, she climbed up to a staircase all the way onto the roof, walked to the edge, and jumped. I wish I could say this was the only incident at the school, but sadly, it's not. It's just one of the more notorious stories. To avoid people who are curious wanting to take a look where she jumped from, the entrance has been sealed off for decades. Enclosed will be a photo from the class of 1985, and you'll notice almost right away something is there that just shouldn't be. Yes, the class photo is still in the glass case along with every single class photo before 1985 till now. With regards to you and Becca, Patrick. Now, if you go over to the Facebook page or you go to the Instagram page, you're going to see this photo. What do I make of it? It's eerie as F. That's what it is. It's eerie as F. I tell you that much. It is bloody terrifying and it is, I don't know what to say. It could it just be a remnant of some sort of, you know, uh, really bad camera equipment? Yes, it absolutely could. Could it also be this girl? Who am I to say? But it's terrifying. Go and check it out right now. Okay, our next email comes in from good friend of the show, Mr. Richard Enrique, or as I like to call him, Ricky Enquires. Richard questions. And he writes, hi, Kev. Hi. Hi, Becca. Hi. Hi, the neighbor's cat. Meow. Oh, the cat just looked at me then and said, what the fuck was that? It was another cat. Yes, we've got two. We haven't. And we don't have one. Mm. Anyway, moving swiftly on. I wrote to you last year about the time I woke up and after a while of being awake, hearing a man sigh next to my right ear. I remember it, Richard. It was terrifying. It really was. Until this morning, I always thought people who have sleep paralysis are lying flat on their back with their arms at their side. This morning, however, I woke up Marty McFly sleep position style, not being able to move for at least 10 seconds. Marty McFly, sleep position style. I don't... What is that stance? Is that like playing a guitar stance? Do you mean? I don't get it. But let's just say it wasn't lying flat on your back. So we'll move on with that as fact. Anyway, this is Richard's little weird experience, which I think is very interesting. I'm not saying that this in itself is paranormal, but the whole scenario is, at the very least, odd. It starts with me asleep, dreaming that I'm walking along a generic shopping area. As with many dreams, there's no lead up to this. It just turns out that way. A young man of about 30 steps out and grabs my left arm around the bicep and says in a Scottish accent 
that it's still early and we should get a pint. What can I say? It's a dream. Dreams are weird. I try to break free, but I wake up in the aforementioned position, not being able to move, and I still have the sensation that my left arm is still being grasped. Only now it feels proportionately like the hand of a large man holding a child's arm. I can feel the individual fingers gripping tightly and gently pulling me. As I slowly shake off the sleep paralysis, the grip fades. It doesn't let go, it just fades. My arm still felt strange for a while, but no marks were left. Like I said, I don't think it's paranormal and it happened in the same room as my other experience. I'm of the opinion that the mind is adjusting between sleep and awake and can play tricks on you although on both occasions it felt very, very real. Love the new format and I'm glad you're enjoying it more. It does come across that way. Thank you, Richard. Yes, I am. And it does. And thank you for your kind words. Um, Interesting though, sleep paralysis. Hmm, Old hags sitting on chests. Or in your case, Marty McFly. I know which one I'd sooner have. No, but it's interesting because I have had sleep paralysis once when I astrally projected. You know the story, people. Yes, you do. And it was awful. That was the worst part about the whole experience. You just can't move. I got pins and needles all over my body as it came off and I moved really slow until I managed to get downstairs and then I was alert and I was awake and I was trying to tell my dad and he looked at me as in to say, "Mm, I'll smoke a bit of whatever you've had, son. So yeah, I do completely feel your anxiety with the whole situation there. Sleep paralysis, it's a bugger. That's a t-shirt, isn't it? So, our good friend Jim Montague's been back in touch, and you remember, he used the word ouvre last time, and I loved it. He says, hi, Kevin. Hi. Becca. Hi. And the neighbour's cat. Meow. Sorry about the use of ouvre in the last email. I loved it. You don't need to apologise. As I said, everyone should use more ouvre. I know it doesn't mean eggs, but you know what I mean. Uh, I'll try to keep the vocabulary in this one more in the line with the we need to talk about ghosts vibe. He did put the word gestalt and then put vibe. No, let's keep Gestalt. So thank you for using uh, the show's Gestalt. I don't know what that means. I imagine it means vibe. Um, Okay. I still have a backlog of your shows to listen to and was listening to one from last year and in it, you and Becca were trying to establish if you'd been at anyone's bedside when they died. And this particular piece of oddness came to mind. Here we go then. This is Jim's email. My great uncle Sammy was lying on his deathbed in hospital some years ago. I was sitting with him as most of his immediate family live in Canada and of the more distant but closer geographically relatives I was the one who was out of work at that point so it didn't really matter to me if I was up in the watches of the night. He was in a small ward but not a private room. There were four beds in the ward but as I recall only two were occupied my great uncle's and the bed directly opposite. The occupant of the opposite bed was a silent figure in dark blue and white striped pyjamas, with gaunt cheeks and sunken eyes. His sparse hair was in wisps around his temples, and he had an IV line in his right arm. He too looked like he was not long for this world. I sat with my great uncle long into his last night. He had been silent other than for his laboured breathing for the entirety of my visit. I don't think he knew that I was there. He stared occasionally, but his eyes were either closed or glassy and apparently sightless, apart from during one salient moment. Around half two in the morning, his eyes opened and his eyebrows twitched in a way that suggested he was looking at something. He didn't speak or try to say anything, but I saw him appear to focus on something at the one o'clock position in his field of view. Then his eyes began to track it to the left. I followed his gaze, as I hadn't heard anything or anyone move. When I looked across, there was nothing to be seen. But as I continued to look, I did see that the patient in the bed opposite appeared to be looking at and tracking the same thing. I noted it but didn't spare too much thought at the time, as my mind was becoming foggy through lack of sleep. Fifteen minutes or so later, my eyes were closing and I thought I'd better get some rest. There was no knowing at that point how much longer he was going to hold on, and I could have been there the following night as well. I left his bedside around quarter to three, and he took his last breath at three. I remember my grandfather saw a psychopomp on his last day and was able to tell us, 
I don't like the look of that one, he said, whilst pointing weakly at a blank ceiling tile. It appears his brother-in-law saw one as well, and that's fine. I am, however, quite disturbed at the idea that someone else approaching a similar condition apparently saw it too. It does rather undermine the idea that they're just comforting hallucinations conjured by the dying brain. Or maybe the other patient was just following his gaze in the same way I was. Best wishes, Jim Montague. Isn't that interesting? Interesting, bloody terrifying, but interesting nonetheless, because it would imply that that's some sort of, yes, psychopomp, but arguably like a Grim Reaper psychopomp coming in and saying, hello, gents, just to let you know, be ready about three o'clock, okay? I'm just going to get a sandwich and I'll be back. Make yourself comfortable. Okay, tatty back. Wear something warm, especially you, Jeffrey. Do you know what I mean? It's a bit scary, that, isn't it? I do believe it, completely believe it. I do believe, you know, you always hear these stories, don't you, at the point of death, people pointing off behind a cupboard or at the foot of the bed, smiling at someone who isn't there. I've got family members who have done it. I'm sure you guys have. We've done a show in the past where we've talked about... um hospice nurses and they've got a plethora of stories of people saying like ah brenda's coming to get me like brenda's been dead 40 years stuff like that and it's fascinating it definitely happens and but as jim points out there you know is it all just in the brain maybe not if that story's anything to go by if two people can see the one thing very very interesting thank you so much jim that's a wonderful follow-up and um keep saying ouvre and also gestalt hmm Our final email for today comes in from Alison and she's got back in touch with a little bit of feedback and also, not feedback, sorry, a suggestion about something as in like, it can't always be ghosts, you know, maybe it's this. So she writes, hi, Kevin. Hi. Hope you and Becca are well in the midst of the never ending pandemic. We are. Thank you. You sent this in before we both got coronavirus. Maybe it was a curse. Mm, I blame you. I don't really. I was just catching up in your Patreon episodes and there were two things that struck me. One was the story about the dog on the road who was described as inky and fading in and out of this dimension. When I was a guest on your show, we talked about what was in my New Jersey apartment on and off for 17 years, and I described it as a black mist. Yes, you did indeed, Alison. When I recently reported to you about seeing what I thought was our recently deceased dog, Kylie, running by her bed, it was very similar, except she was much lower to the floor than your apartment's mist. After hearing the word inky, I would say that describes it even better. There was a fluid, watery quality to it, so I thought I would let you know that. It's very interesting. I completely agree, Alison, it is indeed. Very interesting. The other thing I wanted to pass on to you, and especially Becca, concerns the story about the new build ghosts. And this, guys, is about ghosts in new build apartments or houses. I knew I had to write to you because I do know from personal experience that off gassing can be the cause of many physical and neurological problems. Here in New Jersey, there are loads of new bills, which we not so fondly call McMansions. They are so cheaply constructed and they are pretty toxic for many reasons. One quick example is this. In place of nails, which take time and effort to hammer in, these houses are held together mainly by a toxic glue that takes years to off-gas. So where a builder would have once used 20 nails, they are now using two and using lots of glue instead. There is a lot more corner cutting than you can imagine, and none of it is eco or human friendly. I knew someone with a new build house, and whenever I was there for about half an hour or so, I would begin to feel sick. It always felt like I was getting the flu, complete with aches, a runny nose, and a sore throat. After, I would be back home for a couple of hours, and I would feel fine. It occurred to me that I might be allergic to this person's house. I did some research, and sure enough, it's a common problem with new builds. In addition to chemicals in the cheap building materials, many of these new complexes have poor electrical wiring that causes high EMFs. Beyond that, there are many of them which have mould problems. Think Salem Witch Trials, those hallucinations are now thought to be caused by a mould in the bread. I'm not saying that there is no uh, way the area is haunted, But if I had to put money on this, I would say she was having a reaction to chemicals in the house itself. Now, do I get a pat on the back from Becca? Yes, you do. Feel free to read this on air if you like. No, thanks. (laughs) I should have read that part first. It's always good to share information because sometimes there really is something physically wrong in this dimension. Take care and give neighbour's cat a pet for me. I will give her a pet. So there you go. 
Alison with some very rational explanations for possible hauntings within new build accommodations. What do you guys think? Do you think that these McMansions are poisoning people? Hmm, I wouldn't know, but I wouldn't put it past them. Anywho, I think it's about that time of the week where we like to join our good sceptical friend, Rebecca, in Reddit Corner. Ladies and gentlemen, now it is time for Paranormal Reddit Corner with Becca. Okay, so I'm, of course, with you. Me. You, the wonderful Becca. Hello, Becca. Hello. And uh, thank you for allowing me into your corner. You're welcome. Your little spooky corner of the internet, which you read from. You know, you know why you're here, don't you? Yes. Yeah. Reddit Corner with Becca. Yes. So, well, you are welcome and welcome. We double welcomes, excellent. Anything paranormal happened to you this week that we need to be aware of? No. We did have a Patreon, me and you, didn't we? Where, uh, or you and I, where we looked at a very skimming the top, skim, skimming the surface, A to Z of the paranormal, and I asked your opinions on each of these letters. Yeah, it's not as long as it sounds. When you say it's the first I know, yeah, yeah. It it wasn't like A B C D E F G. Well, you know what the alphabet is. Um, <laughs> But one of our Patreon listeners was not happy that, uh, or not, not not happy is the wrong word, they were concerned. Yeah, they were worried about, well, me. About you, because you shown um, disregard for the fairy folk. I don't think I showed disregard for fairy folk. I think I said, well, you know, I said what I said. So what I said, can't go back yeah, on it now. And they suggested that we leave out a little offering for them to appease them. We didn't do that. And has anything happened that you could put down to imps, boggarts, fairy folk? <laughs> um, well, I live with an imp. Hey! So oh, the cat. I mean, the neighbour's cat. No, you. Yeah, you mean the neighbour's cat. I don't, I mean you. Well, I'm not the one who pulled up the carpet. Um, no, I didn't think I was. I said anything negative about the fairy folk. I think I said I obviously don't believe in fairies, but Shiver's gone down that poor listener again. I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, But I said that when people like look after them and, and do things, I think that was like looking after nature, which, you know, I thought... Was a nice thing to say. Yeah, like, like well, to show respect to that um, to that habitat. Kind of yeah, well, I mean, I will say, of course, that I 100% believe in fairies, and if they okay. do well, want to throw you... eggs or anything at anyone, it should probably be you. Well, why didn't you leave an offering for me? If you believe and you want to protect me, why didn't you leave an offering for me? I left a cinnamon bun. You never leave a cinnamon I bun. I left it for 30 seconds <laughs> and they didn't left take a it. You cinnamon bun in your life. And I didn't want them to, to, I didn't want it to go stale, so I ate it rather quickly. You should leave them an offering for me then, if you... Yeah, really no, but no, but that's like saying, she doesn't believe in you, but don't hurt her. Yeah, that's exactly what it's saying. Well, I have to do, I'm already working on that line for God, for when you die. I need to stop referring to your death, don't I? Yeah, I know. And I'm an angel, I'll be fine. I'm God. an angel, really don't believe in angels. It turns out from that show. I can believe in me. Well, I do believe in you. Anyway, this is all not relevant about Reddit Corner and the paranormal people that appear on Reddit. Mm -hmm. Try and say that when you're drunk. Paranormal people that appear on Reddit. Are you drunk? I'm not. Well, then knock back when you're drunk. Honestly, God, listen to the instructions, Becca. So, um, I, as you know, if you're new to the show, well, as you won't know if you're new to the show, I found a story on Reddit. I don't read it pre preand. I just give it a quick glance and see if it's a couple of paragraphs. Looks decent. And then I pass it to Becca. She reads it out. And we discuss. Yep, kind of detailed research there. Yep, there you go, Becca. Very pro. This is only three days old. So, welcome to Reddit Corner with Becca. Mm. This story is entitled, I saw my dad as clear as day next to my bed. Let's begin. Let the alarms begin. This happened just a few weeks ago. My dad passed away on New Year's Eve, my birthday. I was with him watching as he took his last breath. One week after he passed, I saw him again. The paranormal events actually started hours after he died. I stopped at Whole Foods after leaving the hospice, and the minute I walk through the doors, I hear Lean On Me start to play. I take it as a message from my dad for my stepmom and I to lean on each other. I get back to his house, and I want to take something with me to remember him. My brain is fuzzy with grief, but I am drawn to this random red stapler on his desk. I grab it and take it home. I put it on my dresser and go to sleep, exhausted. The next morning, my eyes are just opening, and I see this light moving and undulating. I open my eyes and realise it's the morning light bouncing off the stapler. My eyes adjust, and it stops. Odd. The just next... to say, just to jump in. Um, I thought you weren't is... jumping into these. I, 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 I won't, from here on out. Right. Uh, this is dead sad, obviously, because it's to do with the bereavement. But wouldn't it be, shouldn't the song be like, lean on each other? 
as opposed to lean on me. Maybe it's what they could sing to each other. Mm, okay, crack on. Take inspiration from it. Yeah, okay. Does it have to be that literal with you? It would, yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. User, oh, well, I won't say the username just in case, but yeah, user, lean on your stepmom and have your stepmom lean on me. Yeah. Is that what you Lean want on, song? Karen, when you're crying over my death, yeah. for I am your dead dad. Mm-hmm. I'm not there, no. That's awful. Mm. I'm not carrying on with that song. Carry on. Good. I don't think anyone is sad. No, I don't think anyone about this person is. And rightly so. It's awful. You don't mind. Carry I'll on. continue. <laughs> Carry on. Let's continue. The next morning, something very similar happens. See, everyone's forget- forgotten what happened now that was very similar because of you and your interruptions. No, it was the, the, the morning light bouncing around a stapler. That was for comedic effect, I know. People oh, have that short term memory. The next morning, something very similar happens. I'm just opening my eyes, just waking up, and I see this ball of light. It kind of looked like an atom, a bright light in the middle and a few rings around it. It quickly fades as my eyes adjust. Nothing like this has ever happened to me before. Finally, one week after he died, I'm just falling asleep when I open my eyes and realise my dad is standing next to my bed. It is absolutely crystal clear. It looks like a photo, like an imprint in the air, unmoving, of him as he looks like when I was a kid. Maybe late 80s, early 90s? He's wearing a blue and white striped polo style shirt. He has this dark moustache, he wore a beard later in life, and his hair is dark. He has his belly. Before he died, he was so thin from the cancer. My heart just started pounding, and as I stared at him, he just faded away. Since then, I haven't seen anything else. Nothing like this has ever happened to me. I know it's possible it was a waking dream or hallucination or something, but I think he was checking in on me to make sure I was okay. That is lovely, and just for everyone's benefit, Becca being my my moral compass, when she said... Uh, he was very thin from the cancer. She shot me a glance in to say, see, and you were cracking jokes earlier. Just to make it clear, yeah, I'm never clack, cracking jokes that somebody's lost someone in their life. Obviously, that's horrible. But I'm trying to find humour in death, and that can be done. We've all done it. So keep yeah, your know. judging eyes but to yourself. Fair enough. I just think it's worth saying that that was like a really sensitive, touching story, and you're like, bah, bah, bah. Yeah, yeah, of course it was. But, you know, anyway. So, but what I will say is this. So what do you make of that first, before I jump in? Um. Okay, so the song and things, I think... That's, um... Ah, ah, ah. Paradolia. Yes, yeah. Is it Paradolia? Well, it's like a, a, a different kind of a Paradolia, isn't it? You know, it's finding patterns when yeah. you want to when they're not necessarily there, but, you know, find patterns where you want to. Mm. Um, so, I th- you know, I think at some point during that day, if that person really needed kind of help with something, I think they would have found something that they could ascribe to them dad doing it, you know, whether it was something on the radio or a headline in a paper, you know, something like that. I think they could have found something that they would take comfort in, and rightly so. Yeah. Um, You know, the light, I don't know, grieving does funny things to people, like... Yeah, I don't know. know. Um, And also, it's that state, isn't it, between being awake and asleep, where... Hypnagogia. Yeah, what? Hypnagogic state. I don't know what the actual term is, but it's called a hypnagogic state. I thought you just said you didn't know what the actual term is. No, I mean, I don't know. It's a hypnagogic state, but I don't know whether it's hypnagogia or hypnogia or something. Right, okay. Um, Yeah, yeah, so it's like that kind of like in-between thing. So, you know, I don't think it literally happened. That said, as we've said before, I'm going to not say again, if it gives them some comfort, then what's the harm? Mm, But I will say this also. You know what he says? I see my dad there crystal clear in front of me. Mm. I once, in the very same state... Like half asleep, half awake, just coming to. Mm. Um, I seen the baby shaker murderer, Louise Woodward, who was a woman in the UK, who was a nanny who shook a baby to death and made like worldwide coverage, you think, at the time. Mm. I seen her standing next to my bunk bed. Right. Right, right up close against my bunk bed. Mm. Now she'd been in the news, I was in and out of sleep, um, and she must have been on my mind, but I seen her, like absolutely seen her. Mm. So I just mean in that, I think you're right, in that hypnagogic state. And again, I'm not saying it wasn't this guy's dead dad. What a lovely thing if it was, obviously. Yeah. Um, but with him saying it's like it was a still, almost like a photo image, I think that's more of a projection of what you want to see. Not that I wanted to see the murderess <laughs> Louise Woodward, but you know. Yeah. Um, it's interesting as well that the, the still image was the dad in the form that he was in when he, the, per- the person yeah. was a kid. Because that's probably when like most of your formative memories will Yeah, be. but I think that's a common thing, isn't it, about spirit, is that they're meant to appear in they're meant to appear either in the way that you remember them best or in the way that they were at the peak of physicalness. So like it's like you know I mean then again, 
this is where sort of ghosts and stuff contradict themselves because why is there a headless horseman then? Well, yeah, I mean, would he say that he was at his peak then? Like, I don't know, a lot of people I think think they're in the, the fitness peak in like the 20s or something, you know? And... 40s, actually, you'll find. 42, to be exact. Are you in your peak? I'm in my peak. Oh, yeah. You may have noticed I've started playing David Bowie's Golden Years when I'm in the shower, and that's because I'm trying to tell myself this is my prime time. Mm. Golden yeah. years. I am, like, physically, I am actually in my peak. I don't think I'd be a person than I am now. Yeah, well, that's because you didn't do any exercise in your 20s, so you probably are in your peak now. Yeah, I know, that's exactly what I mean, though. That's, that's exactly my point. I didn't do anything in my 20s, and was not in, like, wasn't physically So do you think fit. if you... If you if, now. If, all right, so, well, if, let's say if you just stopped exercising now, and you started eating nothing but Mackies, and then you died in 10 years' time, mm. do you think you'd come back as a ghost now, if that rule applies? Well, that's the question, isn't it? Would it be then, or would it be... Like in your 20s, where you're younger? See, this is where I, I don't think... I think that's just a nice thing that people say about, you know, like, oh, they come back in the prime, or like when mediums say, oh, I can see her looking like this. She's a lovely woman. She's got this and that. I th- I'm starting to now, generally just as we're discussing this, doubt stories where they say, or oh, that belief that they come back as they were in the prime. Because if that's the case, why is the ghost stories about someone dragging their leg or someone carrying their head in their arms? Yeah. Nobody's walking around with a broken leg going, oh, no, never felt fucking better. Exactly, and that's why it's not the spirit person who is there and is projecting himself in that way. It's all in the mind of the person who's doing the projecting, and they picture them in the way that they probably remember them the most clearly, or the most, you know, the form that was most. Yeah, I'm going. I'm going to go with now. I'm going to stand by the rule that all ghosts should be as they appeared at the point of death, unless it's a stone tape ghost, in which case it's just an imprint of a massive emotional blast that's replaying itself. So I don't know. Tell me what you think, guys. What an interesting debate we could have. Mm. Okay, then, Becca, anything that you want to add before you, you leave us here alone? Um, no, I don't think so. Anything you want to add before I leave you here alone? Um, no, thank you for letting us into your corner. You are There's a spider. Where's the spider? I'm joking, of course. And you're not afraid of spiders, I am. I know, I was going to get it for you. Ah, oh, bless you. That was just because we were in a corner. Okay. Anyway. Okay, Becca, speak to you next week. Goodbye. Bye. And that brings us to the end of another lovely We Need to Talk About Ghost episode. Yum, yum, yum. I hope you enjoyed it, guys. And don't forget, if you want to become a patron and get two extra shows each and every week and about a year's worth of back episodes to listen to too, go over to patreon.com forward slash we need to talk about ghosts. If you want to get in touch with the show, contact at talkaboutghost.com. In the meantime and in between time, guys, I shall speak to you all next week. Take care of yourselves and each other. Call me, call me right. Call me right. I've got communist rights, you know. Copyright, Jeremy Springer, mid-90s, styly. I love you all. Tattington, Byington.